Aikoli is a not too well known village tucked away in the Bagalpur district of northern Karnataka. There are many temples here, none of them less than 1300 years old. The Archaeological Survey of India has notified 122 of these as protected monuments and has cleared most of them of encroachments and also fenced in some of them for protection. That makes Ivory one of the most important archaeological sites in India. But much more needs to be done. It is hoped that the archaeological survey will one day take over all of them and maintain them as they have done at the Gurbatri complex. It was in Ivory that the transition of Indian temple architecture from rock cut cave temples to freestanding stone structures to formal shape. The ancient architects experimented with different shapes and forms. Therefore, these monuments are of many different designs and at different stages of construction. But without exception, all of them exhibit exquisite craftsmanship. Therefore, Aikoli is justly known as the cradle of Indian temple architecture. This video is meant to explore this wonderful part of our ancient heritage from an art and architectural perspective. I have used the works of other contributors, of course, with due attribution in addition to my own inputs, so that these magnificent monuments can be better illustrated. Omissions in attribution, if any, are unintentional and are seriously regretted. Along with the somewhat better known Badami and Patadakal, Aikole is also potentially one of the most important tourist destinations in India. It only needs to be properly developed and promoted. Visitors here are not many and even they spend just about half a day here. They take a quick tour of the Durga temple complex before rushing back because Aikole does not have decent or adequate amenities either to stay or to eat. One has to make do with the snacks, fruits or whatever the local vendors have to offer. This is unfortunate because Aihole has so many treasures that will enchant tourists with glimpses of our glorious past. All that is needed is to develop amenities so that tourists can stay here comfortably long enough to take in all its monuments. Before we move on to explore this treasure house of ancient architecture, some history and geography. The Chalukyas of Badami or Eastern Chalukyas were one of the greatest dynasties of India. They ruled for about 200 years during the 6th to the 8th centuries. Their empire spanned a huge territory between the Narmada River to the north and the Kaveri River in the south. The nucleus of this vast empire was a small bean-shaped valley on the banks of the Malaprabha River, the Malaprabha Valley. It is about 30 kilometers long and 8 kilometers wide. Aikole is at the eastern end of this bean. It has existed at least from the 2nd century BC. It is mentioned in old inscriptions as Aryapura and Ayavale and was an important city. It rose to further prominence during the Chalukya period and was the capital city before they moved the capital to Badami for strategic reasons. Aikole retained its importance and in its day became famous all over South India as the hub of activity of a merchant guild called the Ayyavolal Ayyanavuru Swamigalu that is the 500 lords of Ayyavolal. It was the patronage of the rulers and affluent traders like this that led to the construction of hundreds of temples here. Patarakal, which means the coronation stone, was where the Chalukya kings were crowned because the river runs to the north here and the place was considered auspicious. It is in the middle of the valley. In Patarakal, we see the culmination of the experiments that began in Ayoli. Badami that is the ancient Vatapi to which the capital was shifted 
is at the western end of this valley. In all three places, the Chalukyas built many temples for Shiva and Vishnu and not a few for the Jain Tirthankaras as well. To the Chalukyas must be given the credit for the evolution of freestanding stone temples in India. To understand and appreciate the importance of the work, we need to take a quick look at the evolution of temple architecture in India. Even till the Gupta period, that is between the 4th and 5th centuries, temples were either rock-cut cave temples or were built of bricks. Rock-cut temples like the magnificent Karla caves which date back to 160 BCE were carved out of solid rock by hand which is Renama. One cannot but marvel at the dedication and love of the Jain and Buddhist monks who created these wonderful monuments. These cave temples were used as monasteries. They were in remote places far away from the cities. From these rock-cut cave shrines, Hindu temple architecture evolved gradually over centuries to freestanding temples. They were built in northern and central India during the Gupta period, that is, the 5th century CE. These were big temples and could not survive the ravages of time. One such temple was discovered in Bithargaon near Kanpur by archaeologists in 1875. It is one of the very few temples of this type which are still extant. This has since been restored by the Archaeological Survey of India to what it was. In its essential form, the Hindu temple was just a cuboid called the Garbhagraha or Womb Chamber in which the deity was installed. A porch called Mantapa was then added to protect the worshippers from the weather. Then a tower or spire called the Shikara was placed on top of it to give it prominence and make it easy to locate. Later, when Tadakshina or walking round the Garbhagraha became a part of Hindu worship, a passage known as Pradakshinapata or Parikrama or Praharam was built round it. And so the Hindu temple evolved until it became a stupendous structure, mind-boggling in complexity and stunning in its splendor, like the Virupaksha temple in Patadakal. What is exciting about Aihole, Patadakal and Badami is that we can see examples of every phase of this process of evolution. Similar temples had also been built in South India as early as the 1st century CE, but none have survived. The basics and the elements were the same, but the style was noticeably different. The northern and southern schools of architecture came to be known respectively as the Nagara and Dravidian styles. The main difference is in the shape of the spire. The Nagara Shikara is curvilinear, while the Dravidian Vimana is pyramidal. There are some other elements that we need to know about. As the temples grew, the Mantapa became larger and larger with multiple pillars and pilasters to support the roof. Therefore, it became necessary to add an entrance porch or mukhamantapa, also called the Adhamantapa, at the entrance, and also a vestibule called the Antarala at the other end through which the Garbhagraha could be accessed. Niches were placed in the walls with decorative figures. The Gopurams, that is the tall towers on the outer gateways, which we find in South Indian temples, were introduced only after the 10th century and are therefore not relevant here. With that, let us come back to Aihole. Aihole is famous 
for two cave temples and numerous structural stone temples. Most of these temples were in disuse and mixed up with residential structures when 19th century archaeologists took interest in them. These temples were named after the occupant, for example, Lord Khan Gudi or the Temple of Lord Khan or the occupant community like the Badigaragudi meaning Carpenter's Temple and Ambigaragudi meaning Boatman's Temple etc. These names have continued to be used. We shall now start our tour of Ihole the way all tourists do at the Durga Temple complex. There are eight temples in this complex and these have been taken over by the ASI and are well maintained. The Durga Temple is well preserved and is the most exquisitely decorated temple in Ihole. The name is misleading since the temple was originally dedicated to Surya when it was constructed in the early 8th century. It is believed that it came to be known as the Durga Temple after a stone rubble lookout tower called Durga in Kannada was raised upon it. This has now been removed. The original Nagara style tower can now be seen. It is incomplete and its Amalaka finial can be seen on the ground nearby. The Sukhanasa had a relief image of a seated Surya now in the archaeological museum. The western end of the temple is apsidal or semicircular. Chalukya temples with such apsidal plants are found in Aihore and Chikka Mahakuta. They are designated as Gajaprishta because they resemble an elephant's back. The temple itself comprises an outer coronated veranda that wraps around a complete unit comprising a Mukha Mantapa in the east, a rectangular Mantapa and apsidal Garbhagraha surrounded by a Pradakshinapata. The veranda has 33 plain pillars While the pillars of the veranda are quite plain, those at the front of the Durga temple have some of the best sculptures of the early Chalukya period. Most of them are happy couple in charmingly affectionate postures. So let us proceed from the west to the east by the northern side of the structure, remembering to note the carvings of seen from the Ramayana on the basement. The first pillar that we see with the statue shows a couple standing under a tree. The figures are damaged, but what is striking is the graceful dance-like posture of the lady with her body bent at the knees. The next pillar is at the corner where the veranda begins. The figure facing north depicts a couple standing under a banana tree. This sculpture is much damaged, but shows a tall man standing very gracefully on his left leg, while the right leg is thrust beautifully forward. In spite of its damaged condition, the sculpture retains its inherent elegance. The one facing east also shows a couple under a tree, the man leaning against it. The lady stands close to him with her left hand resting on the head of a dwarf. After that, it's a corner pillar. Facing north is another couple standing under a tree. The lady is rests on her right foot with her left hand resting on the head of a dwarf. But the one facing east is more animated. The man is in a fighting posture with his knees bent and his upraised right hand holding a shield and his broken left hand probably held a sword. We are now at the second outside pillar of the porch on the right side. It has a figure of a couple under a tree facing north. The pillar at the right corner of the porch has a very happy couple facing east. The lady has her hands around the neck of her spouse and looks up to him with loving eyes. We are now at the front of the porch. On the eastern face of the pillar in the extreme right is an affectionate and dignified couple. The man is much damaged with his right leg broken. He has placed his left hand on the right shoulder of his spouse who stands close to him. On the east face of the next pillar, which is to the right of the entrance, is another happy couple. The man with his hand on the shoulder of his spouse who is fixing her hair with her right hand. Both have broken arms and legs. 
In the south face of this pillar is a very graceful Dwarapada with his left leg resting on his mace. The handsome Chalukya face, the soft modeling of the body, the rich pearl Agnopavita and the graceful posture make this sculpture extremely attractive and is, it is one of the best examples of Chalukya art here. The first pillar on the left of the entrance facing north is a handsome young man, richly jeweled, resting on a kinnery with horse legs. And on the east face is a female who holds a kneeling brahmacharyan by his hair with her right hand, which she proposes to cut off with a sword held in her left hand. In the corner pillar facing east is a couple in close embrace, looking affectionately at each other. Facing south, there is an Ashwamukhi, that is house face Yakshi, making advances to a brahmacharyan who resists with a raised commandery. In the next pillar, facing south, is a couple standing close together in dignified manner. Their faces are unfortunately defaced. The third pillar has figures of couples in the east and south faces. In the one facing east, the lady looks affectionately at her spouse, who is holding her close to him. The south facing figure has a lady wearing outside the earrings, carrying an infant in her right hand while holding its foot with her left. She and her spouse look lovingly at each other. In the next pillar, from where the corridor round the main hall begins, a damaged figure of Shiva is seen on its eastern face. The forearm Shiva stands erect on a prostrated apasmara. On the south face is a couple under a tree, badly damaged. And in the next pillar, there is another couple under a tree. The lady is resting her left hand on the head of a dwarf. The temple is entered through a steep flight of steps on the east, leading to the imposing Mukamantapa. On the basement of the Mukamantapa are Ramayana scenes. It was the practice of the ancient builders and master craftsmen to sign their works. We find that an artist called Mudhya Sivi has signed on the royal molding. Before entering the Mukamantapa, let us go around the colonnaded veranda. Inside the veranda, that is on the exterior walls of the Mantapa and Palakshinapada, are a number of niches interspersed with lattice windows of different designs. Each niche has a floral carving at base and the Adishtana below. The carved panels set into many of these niches are among the greatest masterpieces of early Chalukyan art. The first and the last east-facing niches, now empty, would have had images of Danda and Pingala, the gods of the Sun Temple. The second niche, also empty, probably contained an image of Arjuna Rishwara, now in the archaeological museum. The third has a beautiful image of an eight-armed Shiva leaning on Nandi. This is called Vrishabhantika. A dwarf Gana holds Nandi's tail. The fourth niche contains the sculpture of a standing Kevra Narasimha, not dissimilar to the one in Cave 3 in Badami. In the next niche is another beautiful but damaged sculpture of Vishnu on Garuda. Vishnu holds the chakra and shanka, that is the discus and the conch, in his upper hand, while the lower right hand is in Varada gesture. Next to him stands an attendant. The fifth niche has a beautiful Varaha in profile with a diminutive Bhudevi at the top and Adisesha at the bottom. The sixth and seventh niches are empty and probably had images of Surya and Shiva's Bhikshadana Murti, both of which are now exhibited in the Archaeological Museum. And in the eighth is a beautiful image of eight-armed Mahishasura Mardini. This is the best specimen of Mahishasura Mardini sculptures in the whole of Chalukya art. The goddess holds a sword a thunderbolt, a discus, a bell and a shanka in her hands while piercing the buffalo demon with a trident. Her lion looks on. The ninth niche contains 
and eight term Harihara with mutilated right arms. He holds the chakram, a bow, a mace, and a shankar. On his side stands a dwarf gana looking up. In the upper region, garden bearing apsaras float towards him. With that, we are again in front of the magnificently carved Mukamantapa. It is supported on four pillars, which have beautiful carvings inside medallions and on bands going around. The front left pillar has a ferocious Narasimha and facing south on the same pillar is a totally drunk lady being half carried by her spouse. Her helpless drunkenness is beautifully expressed in every detail. The pillar on the other side has a lovely Adhanarishwara and a dancing couple facing south. The Mukhamantapa is roofed with two ceiling panels, one showing a Nagaraja with coiled serpent body and the other a wheel with fish spokes surrounded by luxuriant lotus ornaments. The tusk-like struts carrying the transverse beam are modern reinforcements. The entrance doorway leading to the main hall is extremely decorative. In its lower part are river goddesses Ganga and Yamuna, the former on the right and the latter to the left. Then there are Mithunas and Dwarapalas. In the middle bands are Mithunas, Stamba and the Garuda Nagashaka theme. In the architrave region are figures of Brahma in a small niche and Surya in the Gavaksha. In stark contrast to the Mukhamantapa, the Mantapa, the Pradakshinapata and the Garbhagraha are absolutely plain. The Durga temple was originally built within an enclosure wall, of which only the gatehouse remains. On the north wall of this gatehouse, or Pratoli, is a Kannada inscription of Vikramaditya II's reign, that is, somewhere between 733 to 744 CE. This reveals that the temple was dedicated to Sun God Surya and that its patron was an officer called Komara Singha. An icon of Surya is carved onto one of the one of the parapet elements over the passageway. This confirms the original dedication of the temple. Further to the east is the archaeological museum, which is of interest, especially for its large-scale model of Ipoli and its monuments, displayed in an open-air inner court. The garden in front of the museum is dotted with hero memorials and fatigue stones dating from the 12th century and later. Close to the Durga temple, to the southwest, is Chaparaguri. The name is derived from the Kannada Chapara, meaning a thatched roof. It has a slanting roof with a contrasting white colored slab in the middle, probably a later attempt at repair. It also has a portico with nicely sculpted pillars. Inside is a mantapa, again with turned pillars. The doorway to the Garbhagraha is decorated with beautiful lattice work. Nadiragudi. This temple is also close to the Durga temple. It was built with three Garbhagrahas, Srikuta Chala, all of them being accessed to a common entrance at the site. Only one of the shrines with the Dravida style Vimana remains now. Next we move to the Surya Narayana temple. This is an 8th century temple. It comprises of a porch, an enclosed hall, and a sanctum. A pillar in the porch has an inscription which records a grant by the Ayavole 500. There is a kaksasana between the right hand pillars of the porch, but the one on the left is missing. The door frame of the sanctum is decorated with Garuda and Nagasaka motifs, Ganga, Yamuna, etc. The architrave contains a figure of a seated Surya. 
In the sanctum is a 11th century image of Surya in polished black stone. He is flanked by his consorts Usha and Pratyusha. The serpentine probably has, apart from the Surya, the miniature figures of the Vigrahas, thus making it an Avagraha image. A craftsman named Jinalaya has inscribed this name in Kannada on an upper molding in the basement. The Larkan Temple is considered to be the oldest temple in the complex, if not in Aihore itself. It looks like a wooden village assembly hall, which it probably was, because there is an inscription on its front wall that prescribes different fees for different functions like Annaprasana, Upanayana and Madhuri. It has a large pillared Mukhamantapa and Sabamantapa. The Mukhamantapa is on a raised plinth and can be reached by a Hathi Hasta, that is elephant trunk shaped stairway. The side pillars of the Mukhamantapa are joined by a low parapet wall which has kaksasanas or bench seats inside and shows Purna Kalasas on the exterior. A small rectangular sanctum at the rear projects into the hall. It has a linga. In the center of the hall is a large nandi. Both the linga and the nandi are probably later placements. The central ceiling has a panel of Nagaraja. The roof is flat at the center and sloping on all four sides in two stages. Log like stone shafts placed at the joints of the slabs of the roof to prevent leakage of rainwater add to the resemblance to a wooden structure. At the center of the roof is a flat roof sanctum which can be reached by a stone ladder placed in the porch. This sanctum contained an image of Surya now missing. The walls of this sanctum carry images of Vishnu, Surya and Ardhanarishwara respectively in the south, west and north. One of the interesting features of the Larkhan temple is the large stone grill that provides light and ventilation. There are three on each side wall. The central grill has a right angle geometric pattern and the other two have beautiful floral designs. In the west or back wall and in the east or front wall are fixed circular windows with an attractive fish design. This fish design is quite common in Aihole. The pillars of the Mukhamantapa have beautiful images carved on them. On the extreme south pillar of the facade is seen Yamuna standing on her left foot on a tortoise. Similarly, Ganga stands on the extreme north pillar on a Mahara. The eastern face of the pillar on the left of the entrance has a charming couple under a tree. The lady stands resting on her left foot while the right is bent at the knee and thrown back behind the left foot. From the waist upwards, she reclines heavily on her spouse. Her face shows traces of a very happy smile. The pillars have semicircular medallions on which are carved figures and below the medallions are beautiful designs, floral, garlands, animals, etc. Some of the carved figures show a clown standing upside down, a man eating a fruit, a horse trampling a man, and a man holding a cobra. There is an unusual sculpture of Brahma with only one face and holding a lotus in Kamandali. There is a Gajalakshmi with two elephants. The Varaha Ilachina of the Chalukyas is beautifully carved in a medallion on a pillar. It shows a boat, a lamp, a wheel and a conch. Also shown in another pillar are the royal umbrella and chamara, that is the fly whisk. Some of the other pillars have a beautiful nandi with a small gana, ferocious elephants attacking men in two pillars. Then there is a young lady in a very amorous mood. 
She has bent her body at three places in the Sibanga mode. Her female dwarf looks up in surprise and the monkey to her left appears very interested. In another, a lady is seated leaning backwards and her male partner approaches from behind and bends forward. The lady lifts up her face and pulls him close to her face by his hair. And finally, as mentioned earlier, there is a big beautiful Nandi in the center of the Mantapa and a Lingam in the Garbhagraha. There are two Dwaraparatas also, but they are not very distinct. Gaudarabudi stands next to the Radkam and looks similar to it. One important feature is added here, the production of Pata which is introduced by moving the Garbhagraha into the Mantapa. While the pillars are all plain, the beams above them are beautifully carved in three bands with floral motifs, makaras and chaityas respectively. The doorway of the shrine is beautifully decorated with beautiful and delicately done floral carving and a Garuda Nagashaka motif extending down from the lintel. Trifoil niches above the lintel accommodate Gajalakshmi and female attendants. Three rows of stones, some with Chaitya motifs, are seen at the center of the mantapa over the Garbhagraha, indicating that this temple probably carried a Nagara type Shikara. Separated from Gaudaragudi by a stepwell, is of interest for its fully preserved Nagara style tower, complete with all its Gavaksha elements in diminishing tires. This tower is crowned with a prominent Amalaka and a base finial. The adjoining Mantapa, however, is a Rashtrakuta addition of about the 9th century, as can be seen from the style of the columns. Over the sanctuary of this temple rises a pyramidal tower of squat proportions with ornate kudus in the middle of diminishing eave-like tires. On the front of the tower is a cubical projection with a finely sculpted surya icon. The temple is otherwise plain except for the porch, the columns of which have circular designs in the shafts. Worn karasa motifs are seen on the kakshasana. With that, we have finished our tour of the Durga Temple Complex. Hope you enjoyed it. In the next part, we shall do the Ravanapadi Cave and some of the other temples of Ayole. Thanks for watching and do continue to watch the forthcoming course. Bye.